Human factors is a discipline similar to ergonomics, but with a slightly different scope. Firstly, ergonomics is the study of how the workplace interacts with the person working in it. This may include the layout, the equipment, understanding human capacity and capability so that we can design jobs, equipment and workplaces better, looking at how we can make the workplace suit the person, as well as how work affects the people working in that environment. Essentially, ergonomics is interested in assembling information on people's capacities and capabilities and to use that information to design jobs, products, workspaces and equipment more effectively. Both ergonomics and human factors are interested in the interaction of the operator and the demands of the task at hand. Both work to reduce unnecessary stresses of these interactions. There are, however, some key differences between ergonomics and human factors. Ergonomics is traditionally focused on how work affects people, the physiological response to physically demanding work, environmental stressors such as heat, noise and light, complex psychomotor assembly tasks, visual monitoring tasks, and has an emphasis on methods to reduce fatigue by designing tasks so that they fall within people's work capacities. Human Factors, however, is traditionally more interested in the human-machine interface, or human engineering. It is focused on people's behavior as they interact with equipment and their environment, as well as on human size and strength capabilities relative to product and equipment design. The emphasis of Human Factors is often on designs that reduce the potential for human error. Human Factors also takes into account the psychological and emotional stresses associated with the work environment. Ultimately, the terms are often used interchangeably. Broadly speaking, ergonomics is used more in biomechanics literature referring to bodily stresses, and human factors is used more in psychology and engineering referring to senses, perception, and decision making. By definition, human factors is concerning the application of what we know about people, their abilities, characteristics, and limitations to the design of the equipment they use, the environments in which they function, and the jobs they perform. Essentially, ergonomics is focused on how work affects people, more related to biomechanics referring to bodily stresses, whereas human factors is more psychology and engineering based referring to sensation and perception and decision making, but more on this to come. The main disciplines of human factors are human factors engineering, engineering psychology, human machine interaction, cognitive engineering, and industrial organization and psychology. So how did human factors come to be? It emerged during World War II as countries in wartime had a need for people to effectively operate sophisticated machinery, though the early emphasis was on productivity and physiology to fulfill war-related needs. For example, the switches and user interface in fighter planes were originally all the same shape and size. Under high-stress environments, like flying a plane in wartime, it was found that people had a hard time selecting the right toggle, which could lead to catastrophic accidents. This led to changes such as big red buttons and clear defining features for specific functions. It was realized that when we have high task complexity and time constraints, we want to take away any need to make decisions and make things more user-friendly and intuitive. This is the essence of human factors, designing an intuitive interface. After World War II, the discipline continued to grow to meet the challenges of non-military problems. Emphasis shifted to include other objectives such as safer and healthier working environments and improvements in the quality of work life. Human factors was boosted by the space program, computers, and home technology. This led to the development of what we call a user-centered design. The key concept of user-centered designs are simple. The systems are designed to fit the people. This type of design leads to a reduction in training time, minimizes chances for human error, and allows for improvements in the user's comfort, safety, and productivity. This may be a familiar concept to many of us in our everyday lives. We all know how frustrating it can be to navigate a poorly designed website, <coughs> UVic Brightspace, However, we can also appreciate a well-designed user interface that's friendly with clear intuitive pathways and flow. A well-designed user interface of a website will have a clean and visually appealing appearance. Often it can be interacted with in a way that is familiar to us already, usually what we see with the Google Suite. It does not require excess clicking or notifications and information can be found in logical areas. Another example of this is parking signs. In Los Angeles, the system for determining when it was okay to park was extremely confusing, often included contradicting information and was hard to follow through and involved interpreting multiple signs. This system was recently reworked to be replaced with one sign that provides a clear flow of information including a legend, clear schedule, and even a URL and QR code so you can scan it and get further information. Additionally, the sign provided a very clear visual interpretation of when it was okay to park by day using colors of red and green, which we're familiar with, to interpret whether it was okay to park. This is a great example of a much more friendly, user-centered interface where the implement is adapted to fit the needs of the operator. 
If you've ever delved into the world of online gaming, we have another clear example here where user-centered design is really the focus of effective play. In the world of esports, it's important to be able to see a lot of information coming at you from a lot of different places, but really you want to center the most relevant information around the user. In this first interface, we can see that information is scattered all over the screen. It's coming at you from every direction. There's too much of it, and there's no way that you could effectively interpret this amount of information in the time allotted to you. In this example, we can see that now the user face is centered around the user where they're primarily going to be focused. Any important information will pop up on the screen next to the user, and the user interface is kept relatively clear so that the amount of information presented is limited. Human factors activities often include things like accident investigation involving expert witness testimony, simulation and virtual reality for training purposes, occupational and public health and safety, consumer products, as well as basic and applied research. For example, police training may include simulation driving. This allows them to simulate dangerous situations that officers might be faced with on the job and allows them time to practice the proper response without actually causing risk to those involved. Some design considerations for human factors can be things like affordances, user stereotypes or expectancies, stimulus response compatibility, cognitive ability, sensation and perceptual capacities, as well as user preferences. Let's take a look at each of these. Affordances are a relation between an object or an environment and an organism that, through a collection of stimuli, affords the opportunity for that organism to perform an action. Essentially, affordances are little cues or bits of information that help us figure out what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to interact with a given object. Examples of affordances can include a push bar on a door, a clear cue for how the door can be opened and makes it obvious how you're supposed to interact with it. These can be much more obvious than handles, where even when they may be push, many people may still try to pull, or vice versa. Another example would be the handle of a mug, which informs you how to pick it up properly. There can be problems with affordances too. For instance, when the orientation and wording afford behaviors other than those intended. We need to consider all stimuli to help define the appropriate response. Inconsistencies in physical and visual stimuli may lead to inappropriate responses. A handle is normally associated with pull and not push. So in this case, adding the wording doesn't really clarify what you're supposed to do because the visual affordance of the handle is already associated with the pull action. Some other examples of inconsistencies might be where the words are clearly written on the door, but there are arrows, or in this case, hands that are pointing to the opposite door. In certain situations, we might be providing affordances such as the color of these uh, garbage and recycling bins that are there to help us However, it's not perfectly clear what we're supposed to do without looking at the words printed on here. Another good example that you might be familiar with is selecting shower temperature. Do we face the handle or do we face the point opposite the handle to get the temperature of water that we're looking for? Handle shape should properly convey how the hinge works as well. In these examples of car doors, the handle doesn't necessarily orient properly with the hinge in all cases, and it might be unclear whether the door is supposed to slide or pull open. A great example of a user interface that was intended to be intuitive, but probably didn't really nail that function, is the attempt of making a touch interface for Windows 8. Is it necessarily clear here that the images are buttons? Does the button position, shape, color, and wording assist in user interaction? We want to make sure that we're designing things that are going to be intuitive. In this case, having pictures that are mixed in with buttons, as well as text doesn't necessarily imply that all of these are clickable icons. The next thing we need to consider are false affordances. A false affordance is an apparent affordance that does not have any real function, meaning that the individual perceives non-existent possibilities for the action. A good example of a false affordance is a placebo button. A placebo button is a push button with apparent functionality that actually has no effect when pressed. Such buttons can be psychologically rewarding by giving an illusion of control. Examples of these might be in older elevators where the close door button is intended to make it feel that you can close the doors faster even though the doors themselves are on a timer. You've probably also encountered this when you go up to a crosswalk and there's a crosswalk button, you push the button and you get the sense that the more you push the button, the faster the light's gonna turn. In this case, it is a proper affordance in that pushing the button will result in helping to change the light. However, repeatedly pushing the button doesn't actually have any effect. We also want to look out for hidden affordances. A hidden affordance indicates that there are possibilities for action, but these are not perceived by the individual. For example, it's not apparent from looking at a remote control that it could be used to open a beer bottle, but let me assure you, this is in fact the case. 
User stereotypes and expectancies are related to how the response or interaction with objects and our environment is impacted by our prior experience. That is to say, people may develop a cognitive stereotype to improve interaction, which can be positive or negative. You've interacted with a similar interface in the past and thus have certain expectations about how your interactions will go in the future. These stereotypes and expectancies can be positive in that they may lead to increased quality and reaction time with correct object and environment response. However, they can lead to negative experiences like decreased quality and increased reaction time when working with a similar object or environment that does not generate the same response. For example, when you're driving through a quiet intersection and there's never been a reason for you to stop at the stop sign there before, so you just blow through it, but for once there actually is another car. If something violates our expectations from past experience, we may have a negative stereotype. Another example of this can be the confusion over how to properly fill out ballots in an election. As you can see, this does not align with what we're used to seeing when we're reading similar documents. Road user expectancy is a great example of this. As drivers gain experience, they expect things to happen the same. They adjust their speed as they reach a curve because they've experienced curves similar to this before. The more experienced the driver, the greater the expectancy, which can be a very good thing or a very bad thing. More driving experience equals more accurate reactions as long as the expectancy is met, but a sudden change in road conditions violates this expectancy and increases the likelihood of driver error and increased reaction time because they can't rely on their previous experience and they now need to think about a new way in how to respond. To help this, we want to avoid designing roads with sharp curves just over the crest of a hill. We want to place signs at locations where the drivers expect them and where they can see them and make them easily understood. User stereotypes and expectancies can also be problematic when the physical affordance does not match the stereotype of how the object can be used. We call this stimulus-response compatibility. Stimulus-response compatibility is the degree to which a person's perception of the world is compatible with the required action, or the naturalness of the association. It relies on natural affordances and stereotype expectancies to determine natural human decision-making. For example, spatial mapping versus color mapping. Is the object where we actually expect it to be? Cognitive ability is another important aspect of human factors engineering. Cognitive ability is the human ability to multitask and deal with working memory to make decisions. This depends on the type, timing, and amount of stimuli present, the cognitive fatigue, the person's age, as well as other contextual factors. As we age, our cognitive abilities and reaction times go down. Additionally, the ability to make decisions decreases if we're in a stressful situation. So we want to limit decision-making requirements in times of stress. The next thing we'll look at is sensation and perceptual capabilities. Visual complexity is how stimuli is dealt with by the senses. If there are too many visual options, it's hard to determine which ones are relevant. The other thing we want to avoid are perceptual illusions. For instance, can you count the black dots in this image? Which of these lines is the longest? In which of these two images is the orange circle larger? If you're familiar with perceptual illusions, you'll know that the answer is yes, the lines are all the same length, and yes, the two orange circles are the same size. However, the perceptual illusion has led you to believe that some lines might be longer than others, and that the orange circle on the right is larger than the orange circle on the left due to the context that they're arranged in. Whenever possible, we want to design the user-centered interface to avoid perceptual illusions and make expectations match reality. For user preferences, we simply want to design based on what people will expect. What is the most clear or direct path? What is the expected response in a certain situation? For instance, if you're designing the layout of a warehouse and there are two options of paths that you can take to navigate carts, you're going to want to select the option that people are most likely to choose, which is probably going to be the shortest, most direct route. We can use these design considerations to help us apply human factors engineering concepts to create more intuitive and functional work environments. This will increase productivity, decrease the risk of injury and fatigue, and improve the work experience for employees.